my daughter is a vet, and she says that the only thing difference between human beings and animals is that animals suffer once and human beings suffer twice. And what she means by that is, is if an animal breaks its leg, it hurts and uh, it suffers from the leg breaking. Um, but a human being breaks their leg and they worry about how they're going to write their next grant and they worry about how they're going to deal with all the, all the hassles of the delivery systems and things like that. Our research center at the University of Wisconsin isn't interested, isn't capable of, of curing anything. But we are really interested in emphasizing how to get rid of the second type of suffering. And so all the bureaucracy, all of the inefficiencies, all of the waste, all of the rework that goes on in the healthcare system are things that we, we worry about. And uh, the areas that we're currently covering sort of involve on the bottom two different approaches, uh, use of quality improvement and, uh, and also information technology. And on the top, addiction, aging, and cancer. And those are the areas that, uh, that we are in, engaged in. As Tom said, in terms of our uh, computer stuff, we have a lot of different kinds of things ranging from a lung cancer program, but that program isn't aimed at lung cancer patients. It's aimed at the, aimed at the family caregivers of lung cancer patients. And it carries the family caregiver 13 months after the death of the patient to help them through the bereavement period and, uh, and uh, uh, first anniversary and things like that. And we've got stuff in, um, it, with smartphones, but also various kinds of multiple platforms. Uh, our center actually has a, a lot of different disciplines uh, to it. By the way, for those of you who are interested in use of information technology to help people cope uh, m m uh, with uh, various kinds of problems, probably the second most biggest source of that kind of research in that area is in communication sciences. And we really don't read the communication sciences journals maybe as much as we should. But uh, for instance, our team has probably 50 or 60 articles that have been published in those journals. And they just aren't indexed in the medical side of things. But if you're interested in getting into uh, use of technology, going into the communication science literature is a really important place. We have also t uh, faculty from, from computer science and educational psych, well, you can read them. And uh, so a lot of different things. Last night when uh, David was still uh, sober, well, maybe he wasn't, actually. Uh, he asked me to talk a little bit about what systems engineering is. And, uh, and so I won't take a lot of time on this. But, but um, the field is really broken into these areas. And it comes in a lot of different names. You know, Some departments are called operations engineering. Some are called industrial engineering. Some are called systems engineering. Some are called combinations of those, of those kinds of things. But what, what the field really does, and I think it's important to distinguish between science and engineering. And on the bottom there, I think is the key distinction. Engineers are really not in scientists at all. I'm not a scientist. Never pretended to be a scientist. I, I don't discover things. Uh, I don't study the world to figure out uh, important considerations like scientists do. Engineers solve problems. Scientists. Under, develop understanding, develop insight. Uh, you guys are interested, if you're, if you're scientists, in doing things precisely. Engineers are only interested in good enough. We don't really uh, get too bent out of shape about p-values, except we have to get stuff published. We think it's silly. And, uh, and, and so we just aren't into that, that kind of stuff. We're just interested in trying to make things work and work better. And so the kinds of technologies that we use to get at that are things that are up there. I won't go through all of them, but uh, uh, for instance, under the human factors area, that's the part of the field that if you go into a cockpit of a jet plane and you see all that stuff, those systems have been designed by human factors engineers, part of industrial or systems engineering. And they worry a lot about things like uh, stimulus response and compatibility so that if, if somebody gets into a crisis and they have to do something with a the lever, they do, the lever is set up to do what needs to be done in a natural way, the way you naturally respond to things like that. And so they really get into human computer interfaces and that kind of stuff. You hear a lot about care coordination. 
in healthcare. Well, um, product, our production systems engineering stuff is, has been doing that for eons. And, and if you see advertisements on, uh, for UPS, you know, logistics, or if you see stuff about supply chain management, that kind of stuff, all that is is other industries using um, various kinds of technologies that have been constructed explicitly to deal with how you go about coordinating care. And uh, going down a little bit, um, you, you'll find that um, a lot of our stuff is in developing better ways of doing systems or new ways of doing systems. So under the systems category, you'll find that probably within industrial and systems engineering, there's a lot of research that's been done on how to, how to, how to improve systems. But on a very different scale, how do you go about designing systems from scratch so they can be as effective as possible? So that's just a summary of, of, of what we do and who we are. And, uh, and I guess the bottom line is, the only thing we're trying to do is make things work as well as they possibly can. So that we, in all industries, get rid of the second type of suffering. Now, um, I'm now going to switch over to uh, talking about one part of our research, and that is the part that is aimed at um, use of technology to help people cope with various kinds of illnesses. And we're going to be going in and, and talking about the different components of a system that we call CHESS. CHESS means the Comprehensive Health Enhancement Support System. And it's a system that uh, has a lot of parts to it. it. This spider diagram, if you will, covers a lot of the different aspects. I'm only going to pick one right now that um, will give you a sense of how it well, works. Well, stormed out of the office, sure, but it's our hands were shaking. The car roared past, assaulting her with a puff of smoke and all from his energy. Boss's words have beaten down on her like hailstones. You think you're indispensable, Melissa? You think you're an asset? Well, you're not. I should have fired you eight months ago, when you had your little episode. The normal buzz of traffic seemed deafening, like everyone was yelling at her. I wish there was someone I could yell at, or at least just talk to, she thought. Melissa leaned up against the window of a building. Through the glass, she saw an enticing room, warm lighting over soft leather couches and booths. She felt her muscles begin to relax as she imagined that first taste in her mouth riding effortlessly down her throat. She reached into her pocket, feeling for her cell phone instinctively. She plucked it out and connected to her recovery network and selected my status. She switched her status to high, as she had done on so many other occasions since leaving rehab, and slipped it back into her pocket as she walked towards the door. I've got a long walk ahead of me, she reasoned. I'll just slip in to use the restroom. She walked into the bathroom and sat down with her head in her hands, feeling the emptiness swell in her. Her cell phone vibrated and she picked it up and hit answer. Hi, Melissa, said a reassuring voice. This is Jillian. You feeling all right? Jillian was a trusted friend, and Melissa didn't hesitate to tell her just how conflicted she was feeling. After a brief, tense exchange in the bathroom, Melissa continued to talk with Jillian as she made her way towards the front door of the bar. Before they hung up, Jillian brought up her friend Linda. She works in your neighborhood, Jillian said. We've been going to meetings together for almost two years, and she's a great friend. You should add her to your recovery network. She might even be available to meet up with you right now. It would be nice to talk to someone right now. Melissa thought. She opened her recovery network and selected Request Add Linda. That uh, is one of the services within Chess. We call it the panic button. And it's about the third most frequently used service on Chess. What it does is it looks around, tries to find people who are supporters, who are close by, physically close by, who might be able to come over and, uh, and, and help you. It also gives you things to distract you uh, in the meantime, like relaxation games, mindfulness, uh, 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 things of, of that kind of stuff. And uh, while I could go through a lot of other videos, I, I, won't, I won't do that uh, right now. But what I will do is uh, talk a little bit more about uh, the system. By the way, when I, when I do this, I, I, would, I would really love it if you guys would interrupt me at any time and ask questions. I love to be challenged uh, and told I'm full of it because normally I am. And, uh, and, and so 
you know, anytime if I'm being unclear or if I'm raising an issue that you're uh, that you have some questions about, please just uh, just stop me. Um, so, as I said before, chess uh, or HS has a lot of different services. It operates on a smartphone. Uh, currently, we're, it operates on both I iOS, which is the Apple devices, and it operates on uh, Android devices. Uh, uh, we use typically probably an S4, or S5. Uh, uh, system uh, when we when we deliver phones to people, uh, you can see that we offer various kinds of things: social support, virtual counseling, uh, where, for instance, you can use video counseling to talk to somebody. Various kinds of education and training programs, location tracking. There's another video that shows a guy on a bus, and uh, he's having uh, he's he's uh, about ready to go by a place where he used to score in the system with GPS knows that the person is in, is in that dangerous area. So it calls them and says, uh, you know, you got to be careful. Don't, uh, don't do anything dumb. And then sets up a video call with their counselor. Um, various kinds of assessments, uh, ecological momentary assessment. You know what those things are? Basically, randomly during the day, the computer will call the person and say, how you doing? And it might, a might ask four basic questions, like who are you with, where are you at, wh what are you doing, how are you feeling, and things like that. And then that information can be useful as a way of figuring out whether a person is about to relapse. And uh, we also have other kinds of uh, instruments that, uh, that uh, we use to collect data. And then various kinds of alerts and reminders. So that gives you a rough idea. That's my introduction to HS. And from now on, what I'm going to do is be talking about the results of various kinds of research. So what kinds of questions uh, do you have about, or what kinds of comments do you have about what HS is, rather than how well it works? Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's available through your clinical team. So at this point in time, you'd have to have to be linked. One of the reasons we've done that is that um, a walled garden seems to be really important to these people, and so they don't, there's a lot of places where they can interact with each other, uh, and we don't want people going in and joining those discussions. We want those people to feel comfortable that they're members of a, a select a private group, and so the only way you can get onto the system at this point is through uh, for instance, uh, an addiction treatment program. Yeah? How many um, places, programs, or um, clients are using it currently? Currently, there's probably about 1,500 people using it as all. And uh, uh, there's a fair uh, dissemination of it into in the state of Oklahoma. The state has uh, purchased a license to be able to provide it to pretty much everybody there. Um, there, there's a fair amount going on in uh, the Veterans Administration with, um, with, with veterans and uh, individual programs. Missouri, I think, is about ready to come on board, and so it's slowly growing. And yeah? Can you tell me a little bit more about the select community? What are your concerns that you have by your team not? Or is there an incentive to be part of the community health? <coughs> um, I think the thing that, that is, is behind it is that these people are are pretty darn open about what their experiences are, and uh, and uh, they they feel like they're sharing a lot about themselves, uh, a lot of a lot of things that they might otherwise not be willing to share in public, and that kind of stuff. Yeah, very much a confidential. Yeah. Is the community the or the, the walled garden? Is it all fifteen hundred, or is it each particular treatment yeah. program? It, it, we have a, a, what we call a world group okay. that anybody can go into, but then each treatment agency, if they wishes, uh, can have their own groups. The only, only distinction that we make uh, is there's a women's group and a men's group, but there's not a both group. Okay. I have one other follow-up question. Yeah. In the video, it said uh, Linda might be in your neighborhood. Yeah. Would Linda have had to go to the same treatment program, or could she be someone that, you know, they, they met in the... Yes, they can. Uh, the answer is yes. They could expand. They c it didn't. They aren't required to have met within the same group. 
So we have, you know, we have people all over the country who are talking to each other anonymously, theoretically anonymously. Uh, they, the, this privacy thing sounds good, but pretty soon they're, they're saying, you know, giving telephone numbers out, even though we warn them about that. Over here, yeah. Yeah. Sort of trying to do it on their own. It seems like it could be really, really helpful for those people that maybe don't have a great communicator. The first stage of it, of that will happen fairly soon. The VA has decided to make it available to all veterans, okay. uh, and uh, so that'll be the first step in in that opening up of things. Yeah. So can you tell us about this randomized trial? How many clients? Have, like, what was the drinking status of the clients? Sure. Let me move into that in just a second. See if there are other questions about the system itself. Yeah. Any unintended consequences where, particularly in, around drug use, a dealer would get into the group and be able to have a wonderful market? Yeah. There's a couple of things that, that, first, we haven't had that happen so far, but that doesn't mean it won't happen. Uh, we, there are two things that, uh, that tend to go on in these groups. One is there's a lot of self-policing uh, that go, goes okay. on. Uh, and then the second thing is we monitor on a regular basis. So if we, if we see anything like that going on, we'll, 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 uh, we'll cut it off. Let's see. Yes. Yeah, my question was related to the monitoring that's going yeah. on behind the scenes. Yeah. What does that look like? Yeah. We, um, we, except for the obvious kind of things like possibly drug dealing and, the, and that kind of stuff, we don't do a lot of monitoring about, uh, about content and, and that kind of thing. And the person who monitors doesn't know anything about, they know about groups. They know how to facilitate groups, but they aren't an addiction expert in any sense of the word. So what they're going to be worried about a lot is, uh, you know, is, is Tom using the system? Is Tom dropped off? Uh, what can we do to encourage Tom to get back into the into the system like that, a and uh, and also just looking for um, obvious sources of conflict. To be, to be uh, it's it's really f fascinating for me. What would you guess is the biggest source of conflict that's going on in these discussions? Maybe maybe possibly people being a little bit controlling of other people. Like in other words, like I gave you advice, I wanted you to do yeah. this. Yeah, and that's a good answer. It's wrong, but it's a good answer. <laughs> Religion. God, these people fight with each other. I'll tell you, especially you know if you have if you have a more fundamental person that gets on and wants to push their religion off on other people. Oh my God, the stuff that we have to deal with, you know. And and we we then so we then set up a spirituality group where these people can proselytize if they want to, right? But then you have people coming in to see what these damn proselytizers are doing anyway, and it just uh, it's tough. <laughs> now that's an idea. Um, okay, let me move on. Okay, yes, one more question. Yeah. You know, all that sort of yeah. stuff. And secondly, it sounds like they're moving it out of that into, like, for instance, the VA system yep. where it's not a treatment thing. And then how is this system going to be different yep. in terms of what it offers? What We're trying to figure all that stuff out. Now, again, I'm an engineer, and so normally what we'll do is we'll try something in a small way, try to figure out what doesn't work, and then fix it. And try to figure out what that doesn't work and try to fix it. And so we're in the early stages of that. But uh, the, the answers as far as uh, we, are, we are going right now is there'll still be some, uh, in, 
we're going to separate out the what we what you know the VA thing will be a totally separate system from these others. So when people go into that system, they'll realize that they aren't going to have the protection that's uh, uh, available over here. So that's one example of uh, of something that uh, that we're trying to do. But uh, so you know, uh, we're we're learning along the way as we as we try this out. Okay, and then the part where they are part of the treatment system. Yeah. How does it iterate with clients having a bunch of dirty urine yeah. because they're getting thrown off of the Yeah. Yeah. System yeah. Know? Yeah. Uh, a couple of things uh, happen in in that particular case. When a person um, first, I it's important to note that that uh, that, and I can see why this is misleading from the from what I had said earlier. Um, we at this stage don't encourage uh, counseling counseling per se to take place on the thing. For instance. Uh, at um, at a, at a, at uh, Fayette uh, companies in um, Peoria, Illinois, the, there there's about 60 to 100 people on the system. One counselor can provide the necessary support in four hours a month. So it doesn't require a, a lot of time. If, the, if, there, if you conclude that a per person needs to have help, then you encourage them to get back into treatment. But we don't see this as a treatment system in itself. We see it as a relapse prevention system. And the kind of counseling, if you will, that, that goes on there is, uh, is ba basically it sounds like you're really struggling you might want to consider these parts of HS that you could go into. You might also want to give some thought to going back and that kind of stuff. Okay, so let me just, uh, by the way, how much time do I have? How long does this thing go on for? 30 more minutes? I thought I had four and a half hours. <laughs> no, okay. Um, in, in, in any case, so I'll just go over some, uh, uh, some results here of uh, different kinds of uh, studies that we've conducted. Uh, one that's got, gotten a lot of attention was one where we had, uh, we took 300 and some people uh, and um, they, would, they were already all just being discharged from residential treatment for al with a primary diagnosis of alcohol uh, uh, abuse. And uh, they were randomly assigned to a controller and experimental group. And we watched them for, we gave them the, f the phone we gave them the phone for eight months, and we watched what happened to them for 12 months. And I, I think one of the things that is sort of interesting here that, that um, if you look at the differential at month four between the control group in terms of amount of uh, heavy drinking, or I guess in reality I think it's risky drinking days, but in, in yeah, definition. And, um, and then, and, and at eight months, you see the difference. The phone leaves right here. Four months later, the difference has actually expanded between the control and the experimental group, which w we found to be really pretty encouraging. Now, it's a short time. It's only four months. And so we don't know what, what's going on. But Do you think that might be a function of people sharing phone numbers? You know, the, it's, it's possible. I, I don't really know, uh, you, you know, I think it's, there's a lot of speculation as to what, what, might, be, what might be happening there. You notice that, uh, that, that in terms of risky drinking days, you see that there's quite an improvement after, you know, it's going from about 1.5 down to 1.1 in the HS group. And so that would suggest that, it, that because these people have established relationships with other people, which, is, which are so meaningful to <coughs> them, they, uh, they can maintain the contact, as you said. Uh, it also could be uh, they've learned some skills and they've practiced the skills enough that maybe it allows them to can I don't know what's going on, but uh, the nice thing is it's going on, I guess. Huh? Tom? You had 349 the whole way through, so it's not just that the best were contacted following treatment. We had an um, 85 percent uh, uh, con contact rate at tw uh, 12 months, and we were in a, a little bit higher than that uh, other 
other places. So we followed them pretty well. By the way, you want to recruit fast? This thing, the recruitment for this thing moved so fast. We had expected a year it would take to recruit what started out to be about 380 people or something like that. And we had to stop recruiting uh, twice because people were sort of lining up at the door trying to get into the study. And so it, it went really fast. Another, somebody else said, yeah. They were they were within about a week of being discharged from residential care. Everybody's doing pretty good. Yeah, Everybody's yeah. So that's why we don't, for instance, have a pretest score here, because when they got the phone, which was about a week before discharge, theoretically, there wasn't any drinking going on. Yeah. Uh, we called them, it was a timeline follow back. Okay. Now, it's interesting because what we had was out of the, um, out, out of the 349 subjects we had on study, 88 uh, reported that they were also actively, prior to going into treatment, actively engaged with opioids. And so we didn't look at opioid use, stupid. We, I don't know why we didn't, dumb move. But in any case, so we're looking just here at alcohol use for patients who were, who were using opioids. But again, you see the difference between the control group and the experimental group? Even after, <coughs> the, um, uh, after the phone was taken away. And so that's, uh, that's uh, I don't know, that's interesting, I guess. Um, on a different study altogether, uh, this was a, not a randomized trial all sorts of problems with it in terms of uh, uh, quality of the results. A very small number of people, I think it was 44 uh, veterans. And Chris um, Wilkins at Loyola uh, Recovery uh, in Bath, New York, um, selected 44 people who were, uh, had had multiple readmissions. So, and they had to have had three readmissions within the previous 10 months in order to be given a phone. And then they gave the phone to these people and they looked for 10 months more to see what happened to readmission rates. Probably partly because of a regression to the mean, possibly because we just lost some people that we couldn't, make, couldn't follow through on contact and possibly because of the combination of HS and Vivitrol. Those two things together, we saw a 71% reduction in readmissions, uh, which was a substantial uh, readmission. Now, the, the, I think the really important part here is that a lot of research on use of technology looks at the impact of the technology alone, just like we did in our first study. But here, what it is is a bundling of two evidence-based practices together, the use of Vivitrol and the use of the technology, which um, uh, was, I think, pretty cool. I'm going to skip the next slide. Um, just a little bit more evidence on the first study that uh, people got better uh, if they used the system more. So if this, this is how much did you use HS, and up there, the, it's the ris risky drinking days. And you can see the relationship there seems to support where we were. Um, now, as far as predictive analytics, I think this is an important um, uh, study here. Uh, what we d Bayesian models are the right kind of statistics, as opposed to this crappy classical statistics that uh, people learn in, uh, never mind, I won't, I should stop <laughs> proselytizing, David, don't do that. Uh, but anyway, uh, we constructed a Bayesian model to predict whether a person would relapse within the following week based on information about their use of HS and also their BAM scores. Uh, Jim McKay's uh, model to predict, uh, to measure uh, issues like relationship problems and sleeplessness and that kind of stuff. And, um, and the way you, you, we evaluate, and so what happened was that uh, if a person got a score in, the, in uh, somewhere around, you know, greater than 5%, uh, 
what would happen is HS would contact the person and also contact the counselor and say, you know, we're really worried about how you're doing and uh, wonder if uh, you might want to give some thought to um, uh, getting some help or here are ways chess could help you. And the sensitivity and specificity that we chose uh, were ones that specificity would have, I think, means that you don't want to be contacting a person who is not having trouble. And, we're, and so we set it at a pretty high level there. We finally settled at about 86%. Uh, and and uh, the other thing is you don't want to be missing somebody who is having trouble. And we, we're, we left that at about a 25% rate. Now, I don't know how you guys feel, but I, 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 we're told by others that that's not too bad, a predictive analytic. And so uh, we've used that, used that model in our, in our work. Um, so those are the studies that, there's one other, but I just didn't have time to put it on a, on a chart uh, this morning because it's just come in. But uh, those are the studies that are directly related to HS. Dave, yeah. can you go back to the previous slide? Uh, I sure can. So if the patient is prompted to score themselves on the VAM and indicate their substance use, their craving, And so there's a threshold score of five or four. Yeah. Um, what you're saying is um, the likelihood that that person is going to relapse is 74%, um, and the specificity that you're not getting people who aren't going to relapse. Yeah, sure. Uh, what the 74% means is it says, if you're going to relapse, we'll catch you 74% of the time. If you're not going to relapse, we're going to mess up, and we're going to screw up, and we're going to claim you're going to relapse 13% of the time. And what happens if the system thinks you're going to relapse? OK, then what it'll do is uh, a couple of things. It'll contact you, and it'll say, it won't say we think you're going to relapse. We, we, it'll, it'll say something like, based on the information you've given us, it sounds like you might be struggling a bit. Uh, we're worried in particular about your sleeplessness, uh, which seems to have gotten worse over a period of time. And we're worried really also about the relationships uh, that have begun to, t uh, you know, we wouldn't say tank, but uh, uh, something like that. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, and uh, so uh, here are some things that we, have uh, available on HS that you may want to consider taking a look at. Okay, so having too low a specificity, it doesn't provide, it doesn't create the problem of now you're annoying people because you're actually identifying that they have a need. It's just you might not have been um, specific to the relapse rank of the drug use, right? That's right. So you don't suffer from, you know, the, uh, I, I would say the my tribe, the Jewish mother yeah. syndrome. Yeah. Uh, when, you know, uh, leave me alone. Yeah. Uh, uh, so you can afford a, a reasonably higher, uh, a lower level of specificity for the goal of achieving good sensitivity. Would you say that that's right for this kind of application? I would say it's a, a very reasonable position to take. In this particular case, the, the, we just got some really bad reactions from people who were saying, look, I'm fine, you know, uh, uh, what are you doing bothering me kind of thing. And so we, from that, we just assigned a higher cost to that kind of an error than we did to the cost of the other. It might have been a wrong thing. Uh, you know, you make judgments on this all the time, and that's, that's the one that we elected to, to go with. And so. But also could, uh, could affect the tailoring of, the further tailoring of the responses. So as you said, you, did, you wouldn't say, you know, we think you're at risk of relapse. Yeah. But you said maybe the responses themselves may reduce. Right. If, if you change them qualitatively, yeah. they may change the response. Yeah. And actually, you know, in our, in our um, feedback data that we have, even though we may not say to them, we think, I mean, we may not conclude to ourselves that they're going to relapse, 
if we see a, f a factor going down and we have something to offer them, we'll, we'll share that information with the person too. But that's at a different level. Tom? This may not be uh, how much more time. Interesting to have an extraordinarily low rate of relapse. You only have like 5% relapse. Uh, the five, you mean that 5% number there? It's 27 out of 391. Oh, yes, 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 yes. That's right. Thank you. 15 minutes. OK. All right, I'll just shoot myself. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, and go further. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. OK. Uh, <laughs> All right, well, I'll let you guys leave uh, whenever you want to, but you have to stay 15 more minutes. You're not allowed to leave until then. Now, one, one uh, logical conclusion, as a matter of fact, it was brought up by the guy who ran the study that um, I haven't gotten up on paper as yet. And, and what he did was he looked solely at retention uh, in treatment <coughs> uh, after you use this particular system for women who were pregnant and alcohol abusers. And, um, and what he found was that retention doubled. The length of retention of time and treatment doubled for the people who used HS, right? And so what he said was, but you know, I hesitate to compliment HS on it because it may be that it just having the computer made a difference. And or the phone. I, I don't call them phones anymore, so forgive me. When I talk about computers, I'm talking about smartphones. And um, and you know, that's a pretty good argument. Here's a study that we did with breast cancer patients, not with uh, addiction patients. What we did was we took a bunch, I think it was about 200 women with breast cancer. We broke, no, 300, because we broke them into three groups, 100 people each. One group got the, got, uh, uh, the technology, in this case it was a desktop computer or a laptop computer and not a smartphone. They got, one group got the smartphone, uh, one group got the d laptop computer, one group didn't get anything, and one group got chess. And then we wa watched them at two months, nine months, uh, two months, four months, and nine months. Computer was available all that time. What we found was, that, and we looked at, looked at these various kinds of outcome measures, social support, bonding, functional well-being, emotional well-being, depression, Im, uh, concern about self-image, self-efficacy, participation um, in uh, activities of life kind of stuff, and information, the extent to which your information needs have been met. And we compared chess, people who got chess, against people who got internet. We compared chess against people in the control group who didn't. And we compared people in the control group against people who got the internet. And the results really, you can see here, but more specifically, chess was better than the internet on 12 different outcomes. Chess was better than the control group on 11 outcomes. Internet was better than control only once. And control was better than the internet five times. And this suggests to me that probably there, it's not just given the person the technology. It's really what's in the technology. It also suggests that uh, the benefits of internet may be overblown. But David, yeah, also it's interesting to me anyway that the chess seems to have been way better than the internet early <coughs> and way better than control <coughs> later after it was all over. Oh, that's interesting, Tom. Huh, doggone, he isn't so dumb, is he? Um, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Maybe yeah, good observation. Different things for different people at different times. Yeah, yeah. The delta over here in the corner is the only one time when the internet was better than the control on studies. So that was sort of an interesting result, but I think from, for the purposes of what we're talking about here, it looks like the system itself is, is having the impact, not the technology. Um, here's another one. Now, talk about a small study. The other one was 44 people, and, and I, was, I, was, uh, I was saying that was small. This is super small. I mean, this is 24 adult children of alcoholics randomly assigned into three groups, so only eight people per group, right? So you can't reach any conclusions from this, but it, do, it does uh, raise some interesting questions. Again, three groups. 
These were all adult children of alcoholics recruited from newspapers, randomly assigned. One group got group psychotherapy for 10 weeks. One group got chess plus group psychotherapy, and one group got chess. One of the interesting studies, I mean, and I think maybe the most meaningful thing here, was if you look at the average attendance at group psychotherapy, it was 37%. When you added in HS, <coughs> when you added in chess, attendance at chess plus group psychotherapy went to 83%. Humongous increase in, uh, the, uh, over the 10 weeks of uh, the t study trial. Humongous increase in attendance. Now, some other interesting things come up, and I, I don't know what to do with them. Um, anything in this direction means things got worse. Things, see, uh, some psychologists will tell me, no, this is what we want to have happen. We've got to destroy them before we can build them up, okay? And, and so, uh, if, in any, so I, I hesitate to say ba bad things happened. You, you'd call it whatever you want. This means that the scores got worse. Thank you. You're so sweet, matey. Yes. And, and uh, things got better on this side. And, and the yellow is group psychotherapy alone. The blue and the red are either chess or chess plus group psychotherapy. This was over how long? Ten, week, ten weeks of treatment. Ten weeks? Yeah. So I don't know what it means. Yeah. Yeah. Were they going to the same therapist or therapy session using the yellow? They had, to, well, no, they, of the no, it wasn't quality of therapists. It was the same therapy, two separate groups. Right, okay. But uh, they went to, you know, and I think what happens is chess plus group psychotherapy, so chess act, acted as the glue between sessions. And we found this, you know, in stuff we're doing, a, a widowed group at, um, at church in our elderly project and things like that. Existing groups seem to, seem to really use this technology as the bridge between meeting times and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So um, I'm looking at the first one, my service, yeah. where the combined right. uh, aggravates nervousness in the first two weeks yeah. of um, uh, recovery. Yeah. And I'm reminded of a phenomenon I noticed with Vivitrol, where after the first week of treatment, you know, the trade I don't have Oh. They can't escape. Huh. They're locked out of escaping, so they don't even have the fantasy of being able to escape. Oh, interesting. They feel more in touch with their wow. stress. Yeah. Huh. And I'm wondering that if you're coming to group, and the people in the group know what you have said day by day about whether you're feeling upset, you feel like you're slipping, you yeah. need to talk to someone, and you're going to be exposed the minute you walk into the room by all the guys who are wondering how you're doing. I wonder if that's actually, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm saying it may be an accelerator of group process and therapeutic yeah. um, alliance. Um, but it, I wonder if that could account for the, the increased amount of nervousness. It could, could easily. Again, another thing that could account for it is that there's only eight subjects in each group, right? And so you can only take, you can only take this so far. In, in my mind, really, of all this stuff, the idea of, again, supporting the idea of bundling. You know, here we're bundling chess plus group psychotherapy, and all of a sudden you see this dramatic increase in participation, maybe. Oh, is that right? Oh, 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 oh yeah. my God. Oh. Which, which perhaps, I mean, I can't, I don't know, but perhaps for this condition and for these people is a very, needs to be debunked. And that huh. if, if chess plus therapy does as well as this, then this whole notion of, oh, we have to have this separate that, yeah. Well, that's that's really very interesting. Yeah. Um, two things. One, maybe is it the context between group session that that they don't want dyad without mm -hmm. therapist supervision? Yeah, one. So a chess that might not be the case, but we have 
somebody keeping an eye on it. Um, yeah. Not much of a yeah. Deal. It doesn't sound like you do much that all that yeah. much monitoring. I mean, like you, no. you guys wouldn't, if somebody were connecting with somebody else or even socially connecting, you guys wouldn't stop that. You sort of encourage it. Yeah. Yep. I mean, that's what it's there for. The more. <laughs> Ten weeks. Ten, ten weeks. Yeah. I think that's why that blue line has its source. It's way out there yeah. Like that yeah. I think that's right. Yeah. Let me. Uh, yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. You sort of impress with the attendance thing. Yeah. So one could make a case, just again with those adults, yeah. that you don't want them to attend the therapy because the therapy itself is the negative. Well, <laughs> I, I, I don't want to go there, okay? Uh, yeah. Um, chest plus therapy or the chest alone? No, but if you yeah. average the chest plus therapy and the chest yeah. alone, the chest alone is just as good. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. No statistics. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So well, therapist, I don't want to hear that. My, my, my mommy says just leave that and, uh, and, and go on next. So. Um, except, what did I do now? Um, all right, so let's, uh, I'm going to skip that one. <laughs> I want to talk about this one, which and I think is, is probably one of the most significant studies we've ever done. Again, this was, and it says something about, you guys have been so big into parents and, and that kind of stuff for so long. I mean, you know, th this probably should really validate what, what you're saying. Again, this system was not designed for lung cancer patients. It was g designed for the family caregiver of lung cancer patients. So they would be able to talk to other family caregivers. They, they, in, in there, there was education and training on how to be a good caregiver. There was some stuff on respite, on how you can take care of yourself. There was stuff on bereavement and that kind of thing. The lung cancer patients could watch it. I'm not saying they couldn't watch it, but the system, and there was even a, dis, a discussion group for lung cancer patients, but the system was clearly, for, for anybody involved, it was clearly aimed at the, at the lung cancer caregiver. And what we, uh, what we did was we, we took the chest system that we have for lung cancer, and we added in a, a particular component that I'll talk about in a second, and, and, um, and that was a component where when we collected the data about a, how a patient was doing, if, a, if a, an outcome went over a certain threshold, like if a, the doc said, if a patient hasn't had a bowel movement in the last three days, we want to know about it, okay? We want to know about it right away. So they, for 10 different measures of outcome, they defined what these notification points would be for pain, for nausea, for shortness of breath, you know, the kind of things that are common for lung cancer patients. And then we, uh, we made those kind of contacts. Actually, the clinician could see the data on how the patient was doing in three different ways. They could call it up anytime they wanted to. The day before scheduled visit to the doctor, a summary was printed and sent to the doc in whatever form they wanted, fax, email, whatever. And then uh, the third thing was if these unusual events occurred. And uh, what we found was that uh, there were all sorts of positive impacts. I mean, the symptom distress of the patient went down. Uh, the, uh, you know, the caregiver burden went down. But this was the most interesting thing, that the patients lived 35% longer who had access to chess. And uh, remember, to, who, I should say it different. The patients whose family caregiver had access to chess lived 35% longer. More than that, one of the things we were wor really worried about is are we saying, well, are we extending suffering? And as it turns out, no. That, that the patients who lived longer, we sort of looked back X number of weeks from death, four weeks from death, eight weeks from death, 12 weeks from death, things like that. And there was less suffering all the way along for the patients whose family caregiver had access to chess. Yeah? Do you have or are you planning to create a similar model for family members of folks suffering from addiction? Yes. Uh, we, 
we, we are we submitted one uh, we submitted an application for what we call the fam fam chess, uh, and it got killed by reviewers, uh, and, and so we're resubmitting. And I think there were some good reasons for it, for them killing it. We were we were aimed at, at veterans first, and and uh, we didn't carefully think about the potential for the veteran getting into the discussion groups of the family members and possibly that or leading to violence or that kind of stuff. And so they really hammered us on that and we're, we're, gonna, we're resubmitting. Yeah. Yeah. Kid comes out of a treatment program yeah. And that continuing care. Absolutely right. Yeah. And that in, in really, you know, it, it it is different. I don't mean to imply that they're the same thing, but there are very big similarities too with uh, with lung cancer. You know, your husband or your wife has just been diagnosed with lung cancer. Uh, your relationship hasn't been all that great, uh, and now you are the family caregiver, and. You know, you can imagine the different, or the relationships have been wonderful, and and you know, but it it creates a whole new lifestyle that you're going to have to engage in, and the end is very clear: the patient's going to die. Uh, period. I mean, it, it, virtually nobody from stage four, and we only selected patients who are stage three, B, and four. Nobody lives with lung cancer. But also those indicators, you need to get in touch with a counselor if, or your clinician if the yeah. treatment or bowel movement. Yeah. Is Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, and also with expert and pediatrician. I mean, you've got a kid, what do you watch out for? When do you intervene? So a pediatrician identifies this kid is at risk or low level using. Parents are armed now with filling out some quick questionnaires about what they're yeah. doing. But was, was there more medical care in the chest plus the Is that the I, I will give you your five dollars after the meeting, okay? Uh, yeah, by the way, it's 11.01, which means, or 11 o'clock, so I won't feel the least bit uncomfortable for those of you who leave the room now. It may, I might cry, but I, it, it will be for some other, but really, if you have other things to do, I just f feel perfectly comfortable getting up. We actually, before we did this particular study, we carried out a different study, and that was a randomized trial of patients who in, in lung cancer, uh, it was a combination of lung cancer patients and uh, breast cancer and one other kind of cancer. A and we broke down people into two groups, groups who, would not, who you collected this data for, but you would not give any information to the doc, and groups who you would give the information to the doc. And what we found was that, uh, in th this doesn't show on this screen, but there was more, the time to treatment, the time to response to treatment was shorter when you shared this information. And then when you looked at the next report of their health status, the percent of patients who improved almost doubled, which says that that information going to the clinician at the right time in the right way, so to speak, assuming we're right, so made a these were non-hospice patients at, uh, at the time that the study started. Okay. Yeah. Some of them obviously became hospice patients as we went on. Um, okay, so I, I'm going to mention just a couple of other, other things. Uh, one is, uh, this is a theory-based program. It's built on self-determination theory. So what we try to do is we try to improve a person's coping competence a person's social relatedness, and a person's autonomous motivation. Because self-determination theory says <laughs> those three things are likely to, to do it. Actually, I think theory sucks. And I, I don't have much truck for it at all. I think it's, an, it's a lazy person's way of avoiding getting out and getting dirty with their customers. And so we only chose that because NCI said we had to find a theory. Yeah. <laughs> but what we really did was, you know, each time that we get into treating a different set of patients, we try to really 
uh, absorb what it's like to be the customer we're trying to serve. So when, you know, in our addiction work, you, some of you guys know, I got myself admitted for heroin addiction. I went through the process of doing all the forms, of doing all the interviews. I stayed overnight in a detox facility. I went to treatment in a residential care f facility only for a day. But, um, and in the case of, of aging, I don't need to guess too much about that because I is one. But all of our programmers have to volunteer four hours a week in, an el in a, a senior care center. Because while I think that, you know, I'm overdoing on theory, I think it has some potential benefits. But it doesn't begin to be able to get you to the point where you can really try to understand. I mean, the number of stories. You go talk to our programmers, you know, and they'll tell you story after story after story about elderly people. And what that does is it takes those people, those programmers, and takes them from a job and it puts them into a calling. That's very important for me. I want those people to be thinking about this day and night. I want them to see themselves as having a mission of making a difference in the lives of people. And I think if you limit yourself to theory, you're in trouble on that, on that side. Oh, somebody's got to say something. I, I'm full of, I am full of shit. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, I, I, f I feel that way. I know I'm going to the extreme. There are really merits to having, having a theory. As George Box once said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And so, uh, you know, it, it's, it, 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 but it is important, I think, to touch the customer and to really understand what's, in, what's involved. Um, let's see. I think I'm going to... Yeah, I, this would get me into a whole new set of things. And so I think I'll stop there. And, uh